great, great, great. Hooray. <laughs> okay. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much, Jay, for that reading. That was, um, I was transfixed. I don't know about you all. Um, and that was such a, um, so such a gorgeous way to start, to start the reading. I think we should all do that more often. Um, okay. So I'm Mara Kwan. I go by Reese. Um, thank you to Bomb. Thank you to, thank you to Loyalty and to Libby and Josh and all of you for being here and for waiting and for jumping rooms with us. Um, it is the publication day today for life events and for I Hold a Wolf by the Ears. Hooray! Books, books. Um, so Libby mentioned I know how you can buy the book. Um, I'm just going to take a quick moment to encourage you to, um, to buy the book today from that link from Loyalty. Um, and to please keep in mind that it might take a minute, like what with the pandemic and the uprising, post offices are having a hard time um, and booksellers are working like much too hard. I feel like every bookseller I know is, um, is going through a lot. Um, and so just, I would encourage you to buy it from loyalty and to, and to perhaps have just a tiny bit of patience um, about when exactly the book shows up. I personally have given up like all expectations about when books show up and it's kind of glorious because books just like randomly show up now. Um, and I have forgotten to even wait for them. Okay, um, and both of these books are so wonderful. Um, and I, I'm gonna just say a little bit about what I love about both of them. Um, they both, both of these books, so Life Events and I Hold a Wolf by the Ears, um, they both engage in what feels to me like a passionate pursuit of truth or truths. Um, and in the avoidance of lies, in the avoidance of half measures of overblown language, um, there's an attentive, attentiveness to how an attention, there, there's a quality of attention to how they look at things others might not or might not know how to look at. Um, and in that way, for me at least, or the experience of reading these books, um, I was tremendously moved. I was, um, I was fascinated by, um, by so many sentences and paragraphs and pages. Um, and I was also, I felt, I also did like, um, I also did find it to be even reviewing these books while um, just before this event. Um, I just found them to be such a such a such a such a wonderful antidote to to the day's news and to everything that's going and to so much of what's going on on a daily basis. Um, let's see. I'm getting sorry. I'm getting updates on my phone about where um, Laura and Carolina are, and I believe they're en route, from what I can tell. <laughs> okay. Um, well, the next thing I would say is um, is Laura's and Carolina's bios I kind of wish we had them but I'll just I'll just go ahead and say this okay um so Laura Vandenberg was born and raised in Florida and is the author of five works of fiction including the third hotel which was a finalist for the New York Public Library Young Lions Fiction Award um and her new book is I Hold a Wolf by the Ears Carolina Vatslaviak um, is the author of the novels Life Events how to Get into the Twin Palms and the Invaders. Um, formerly an editor at The Believer, she is executive editor of culture at BuzzFeed News. Her writing has appeared in the New York Times, LA Times, the Virginia Quarterly Review, Hazlitt, and elsewhere. Um, all right, now's a point where, in theory, I would, I, would, um, I, would, I would start asking Laura and Carolina questions about their, um, about their, about their really wonderful work. Um, okay. I'm, I'm seeing the last text I saw is whew. So ha, Carolina. Hi. <laughs> Ghost in the machine. Yay. Hi. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, so I imagine we're getting Laura in just a second. Um, in the meantime, while we're waiting, Carolina, do you want to tell us where? Um, <laughs> there's drama, right? There's, t there's tension. There's a lot there's of drama. Yay. <laughs> yes. You made it. Yay. You made it. <laughs> Oh, wow. Real nail biter. Yeah, I was joking. I was having some tech issues earlier when we were in the green room, and I was joking that I had injected my chaotic Gemini energy into the event. But I, yeah. um, this Always is so blame exciting. astrology for everything. Yeah, that's right. I know. I was like, Mercury is in, re in retrograde anymore. I think we're not even in the shadow period, so... Air signs will take. Air signs will will take the will take. The <laughs> um, were you? I couldn't tell from the. Could you? Were, were you? Was I like audible to y'all while I was talking? The stuff I was saying. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, okay. All right. So I won't review Thank that. You so stuff. much. You did an amazing job. <laughs> yeah. I feel so. We should all have like a song at the ready for some of these interludes. We could like sing karaoke yeah. last. We're really gonna sing karaoke. Okay. This is all right. like the home karaoke machine. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
uh, well, I so we're this is room with a view, and since since that is the theme of the evening, along with um, along with Carolina's and Laura's wonderful books, um, can you all tell us where you're where you are right now, physically, geographically? Sure, um, I'm in LA in my uh apartment in silver lake and uh currently in my living room which is a new room for me to be sitting in usually i'm in my kitchen 24 7 working yeah and i'm in i i'm in florida um where i'm from but haven't spent this much time in florida in a really long time but i've been here since early march great and i'm in um right now i'm in um i'm in a small town outside of San Francisco. Um, so yeah. Hi, everybody. Um, let's see. So let's I'm a long time and fervent admirer um, of both of you and of your work. Um, but I don't actually know how do you know each other? And what made you think of having your first your first event together, which always feels so special? Um, I feel like we're on like the same publishing schedule. I our books were you have five, I have three, but they're, we're coming out around the same time. And I was a great admirer of your work. Um, and you blurred my second book. And I just feel like our work is always in conversation with each other in a way, um, certainly in the things that we're interested in. So, and we're both on FSG, so. Yeah, and we both share um, the same amazing editor, uh, Emily Bell. Um, who, yeah, it's, in, it's incredible. So we have that in common as well. But yeah, I remember, I mean, I still, you know, I mean, it's been a, a minute since I read your debut novel, Carolina, but I mean, I remember how to get into the Twin Palms. I loved your second book too, of course, but I'm just thinking of like, like the, for me, like the Carolina origin, I remember um, your first book so, so well and can just remember certain scenes and passages viscerally. And I think, yeah, I mean, I, I've always, loved your work um and i think both of these books even though you know they're very different kinds of landscapes are really landscape oriented and i um i, I love that about about life events the sort of attention to landscape to the physical world and i i think that they have synergy there as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. great um are you uh i'm gonna ask you both, you both um Lena, maybe, and then and then Laura. Um, can you tell us for anyone who hasn't read it, read your books yet? Um, can you tell us about your new books and uh, and yeah, just to like situate us? Sure. Um, so my book follows a woman named Evelyn. She's thirty seven. Her life is sort of starting to fall apart. Uh, she's on the precipice of a divorce and. Um, in this moment of crisis where she's feeling like she's been so out of touch with her feelings and she has a lot of fear about her parents dying, she decides to start helping people um, die. So she joins this um, consortium of exit guides and uh, basically goes around to different clients and helps them um, exit the earth. So. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you, Carolina. Can um, Laura? Would you mind also um, telling us about your about your? Yeah, name? yeah. So, um, I hold a wolf by the ears is a collection of short stories, eleven stories, um, and they all are. I've been calling the collection, describing it as um, sideways ghost stories, which is to say that they come from the haunted at kind of an unexpected angle, and you know sometimes. Um, there is a literal ghost and sometimes the, you know, the haunting is more associative in nature. But I also think about it as being a book um, about women who are haunted and who haunt in equal measure. Mm, I love that so much. Um, okay, great. And now we're gonna, what we're going to do is Laura and Carolina are going to read very briefly from their books. And then we're going to talk um, separately briefly about, about their books. And but then after that, we're going to um, have more general questions. And then, so you know, we'll have time, we'll have about 15 minutes for a QA. and a um, So um, please get your questions in if you want them asked. Um, let's see, okay, so Carolina, can you read your excerpt um, that you have ready for from Life Events? Sure. Um, so this is a portion of chapter two, and um, it's Evelyn in her apartment in Los Angeles. When I got home, Bobby wasn't in our apartment, but I assumed he'd be back soon, so I got to cooking. I made an entire meal and ate it, and he still did not come home. I went to sit on our patio to have a drink, and then another. 
not to wait for him exactly, and not to get drunk exactly. Sitting on the patio, taking frequent sips from my glass, I noticed a small bird body quivering in the dusk light. I put my glass down and leaned over to get a closer look. His feet were curled around the rim of my hummingbird feeder, and his small feathered body convulsed, eyes closed, tongue lurching in and out of his beak. I hadn't expected to spend my evening watching a hummingbird die, but I didn't know he was dying just then. I thought he might have been sleeping, or foolishly, I thought he was just resting. There's a woman to call when you find a hummingbird in distress. I dialed her number while staring at the bird as he swayed back and forth. When I explained the symptoms and the sway, she told me the bird was dying. She said it was experiencing an excruciating death. She said I could help it along to ease its suffering. I found a box and a hand towel and made a bed for him. I cupped my hands around his tiny bird body and was surprised that his feet would not move. I tried to pull at him gently and finally the bird gave in to me. I laid him down on the towel, tucked him in, and took him inside. It was, the one, it was one thing to feed a bird and another to become responsible for its life or snuffing it out. Outside in the dusk light, the hummingbird's feathers were a dirty brown, but inside each feather shimmered a brilliant magenta and teal. I tried to quantify the size of each feather, anticipating one day telling the story at a dinner party of how I played death doula to a bird and couldn't find an appropriate equivalent. Smaller than a snowflake? What would sound good in the retelling? Why ha had I immediately assumed it to be he? I had read that male birds always had superior plumage to females in order to attract. Males held the power and the beauty. The name of the woman on the phone was Helen, and I kept saying things like, that's terrible to hear, Helen, and are you sure he won't survive, Helen? And, oh, that's awful, Helen. I wondered if she thought I had made the bird sick, if she was silently judging me during the call. I worried that I was the cause of his suffering. Helen told me if I was calling her, I cared enough to not have been the cause. She hoped that I cared enough to kill it. Helen told me to crush up an anti-inflammatory pill and mix it up with the simple syrup I made each day for the massive hummingbirds that would migrate to our feeders. She said to mix in one crushed tablet of my anxiety medication to let the hummingbird go to sleep. She told me it would be okay that doing this would not make me a bad person. To make me feel better, she kept saying it was going to die anyway. I found my bottle of Xanax at the bottom of my purse, took one myself, and broke another half pill to crush up and mix with the syrup. I found an eyedropper and took all the steps Helen advised. The bird did not die right away. I spent hours with him, dropping the mixture onto his tongue, hoping he would take the sip that would finally dull his pain. The agony was in the waiting. At one point, his feathers stopped shivering with iridescent light. His eyes opened, and I hoped he saw me trying to help. I refilled the dropper over and over and finally watched the bird lie down on his side, tucked into the seams of the towel, and breathe easier, convulse less. In the aftermath, all I felt was a kind of blankness. I buried him in one of our potted plants on the patio in the shadow of a succulent. Thank you so much, Carolina. Um... I want to, uh, that section that you read, I remember when I was reading this book um, that I remember reading that section and I just like turned to, I turned to Michael, my husband, and I was like, this is really fucking good. <laughs> um, I was so excited. Like, I don't know. I feel as though that that scene really um, just like really, really sets up a lot of, a lot of the, a lot of the, a lot of concerns of the book. Um, and it's just so, it's like so incredibly moving. Um I, I guess I, I would love to ask you about, so this book has a lot to do with um, something that I found, one of the many things I found really interesting about this, um, about this incredible book is, is, is how focused it is on, on anticipatory grief, um, writing about loss, loss that is like most likely about to happen, um, or it will happen soon-ish maybe. Um, and I wonder if you could talk about that, because I feel so that's not something that's, um, that's, that's um, grappled with as often, perhaps in, in fiction. Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, I sort of became obsessed with this idea of pre-grieving, which I really, like, I couldn't even find the words for it, really. But it, it, it was an anticipation of the bad thing happening. Um, and so I wanted to try to capture that and that, that waiting period before somebody has died where you know it's terminal, there's no getting better. Um, but they're often you know, 
when people are dying, it doesn't happen in a day or two. There's often sickness associated with it. And I wanted to look at how you manage your pain and suffering and the anxiety of a coming thing that isn't coming. Um, and I think for Evelyn, my character, she really wanted to game out like feeling less so that when the time came, she would be sort of desensitized. And so she puts herself in these situations where she is trying to desensitize herself from grief in hopes of figuring out like, how can I feel this now? So when my parents die, I feel it less, which of course doesn't work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I feel as though it's, it's, it's so your, this book is so powerful in doing exactly what you're, what you're describing. Um, and there's an interview with maybe like the question I'll ask next has to do with, um, it's from an interview. It's from a bomb interview with Diane Cook. Um, especially since I see Diane just made a just just gave a comment. Hi, Diane. And <laughs> um, there was the thing that 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 you said in an interview with Diane um, that made me want to stand up and cheer. And you said something about how this was exactly the book I wanted to write, and I did it. And that's so fucking mm -hmm. awesome. Um, this is your so this is your third book. And for all the I know there are a lot of writers and artists in the audience. Um, can you tell us more about that? Like, uh, yeah, how'd you do that? <laughs> um, how did I do that? Well, first, just shout out to my agent who got me out of the book deal that I was writing the book I didn't want to be writing um, and felt like a lot of pressure to be hitting due dates that just were untenable. And I was, I felt like I was writing myself into a corner. Um, and I wrote a whole first draft of a book and it just didn't feel right. It just absolutely didn't feel right. But I, it was like, I was on a timetable and that works for some writers. It absolutely didn't work for me. So like I said, um, Kirby, like basically worked magic for me to get out of this book deal. I threw that whole first draft away and I started over with no deadline, no timetable. And that freedom of not having to make anybody happy or um, meet any kind of deadline or be commercial, really. Like I just was, I just decided, what is the book that you wanna write? What is your central concern right now? And that was really trying to navigate the, own, the fears that I had myself. And so I wrote a book that, you know, and I say this to writers, young writers that I talk to, write, like you don't think anyone will ever see what you're writing so you can be the most honest. And that's really what I did. And, you know, Emily Bell, who I've wanted to work with for so long, saw it and we worked together. And even then I, I added like 50 or 60 pages in the editing process. And it was just like, I was taking my time and, and finding my way into this book. Um, and, and as it happened, like it turned out well. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> I love that so much. And I love that folded in is just like, of, of like, it, w it wasn't going very easily at all. And no. especially at first with, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, no, this is a book where this happens for me so rarely, I find, um, where I really, I know, and I know I said this, but um, in my blurb, but I didn't feel as though a single sentence rang false, um, which is incredible. I think it's so mm -hmm. hard to, it's so hard not to lie. It's so hard not to, um, it's so hard to, actually dig for the kind of truth that I think and truths that you're that you're digging for. Yeah. Um, I was trying um, to write unselfconsciously, basically, mm -hmm. like not mm -hmm. feeling like I was trying to um, reach some kind of goal. It really made mm -hmm. me be less self-conscious, basically. Mm -hmm. I love that. Um, I, I want to ask you more about more about your book, of course, but I um, maybe maybe right now we'll switch over to Laura for a couple of questions and for her reading. Um, Laura, would you mind reading your uh, reading what you your excerpt? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm just going to read the first um, couple of pages of a story from Wolf called Slumberland. Mm -hmm. I spent that summer driving around at night and taking photographs because I could not stand the sound of my neighbor wailing through the walls. This neighbor lived in the apartment above me, and when I passed her in the stairwells, she looked perfectly regular, 
but at around 10 o'clock at night, she would start carrying on, and her uncorked sadness had a physical effect on me. My skin itched, my teeth ached, a clear liquid leaked from one of my ears. Once I even got a nosebleed. I wondered if our other neighbors could hear her and if anyone had knocked on her door or called building management to complain. I did not knock on her door or call building management to complain because I did not want to confront whatever was happening in my neighbor's apartment. I wanted only to get away. The apartment complex I was fleeing was north of Orlando, situated between the Daltona Lakes and the Seminole State Forest. My life there seemed provisional, even though I had no immediate plans to move, and so it felt natural to wander. As I drove around looking for things to photograph, I added up what little I knew about my neighbor. She had lived in the apartment complex for six months. I did not know her first name, but from the mailboxes, I knew her last, Novak, unless that name was left over from the people who had lived there before, which was possible. Until this wailing situation, I had not paid particularly close attention to the mailboxes. My neighbor had a shoulder tattoo that spelled out something inscrutable and dainty cursive lettering. I often passed her hauling swollen bags from Dollar Tree up and down the stairwell. I had no idea what she did for a living. We had never really spoken, just waves and nods. She used to have a cat, but a few months after she moved in, the cat vanished. I remembered seeing signs in the laundry room, a photo of a black and white cat, the offer of a meager reward. Things my neighbor did not know about me. I have taken photographs all my life. My first camera was a Kodak. I used to make my living as a wedding photographer, but after moving into the apartment complex, I migrated over to pet portraiture. There was a surprising amount of money to be made in photographing German shepherds in bow ties. Plus, no one ruins their life by getting a dog. When I ran out of facts about my neighbor, I cataloged the subjects I had photographed so far, a sinkhole, roadkill, the molten night air, and all the near invisible things floating through it, the sidewalk still damp from afternoon rains, the long dark arcs of hallways, fluorescent lit parking lots, malls. There was a specific and terrible sadness to the malls, those places where people went to give in to their loneliness. Sometimes I photographed human beings, a man sleeping under the scant shelter of a bus stop, a waitress smoking a cigarette outside an IHOP. Sometimes I parked in an unfamiliar neighborhood and walked around with my camera, my armpits dripping under my shirt. That was how I got the mother and son haloed in the warm light of their kitchen. The mother was kneeling in front of her son, who looked to be about six or seven, and dabbing ointment on his forehead with her pinky finger. So precise, so tender. Their house didn't have front lights or a fence, and so to get this shot, I crept onto their lawn, moving in a squat like the creature of the night I was becoming, ashamed of how much I enjoyed it. If apprehended by the mother, I could have said, I had what you had once, or a version of it, and I long to visit that lost world. I will stop there. Thank you, thank you. Um, and yes, Marie's right, you're such a gorgeous reader, both of you are. Um, so maybe I'll start by saying that um, I remember in grad school, um, uh, uh, one of my mentors said, um, no one's really good at both stories and novels, except for like three people. And, and I was thinking about that as I was thinking about like, like your book and like, all, and like all your work. And I was just like, I think, I think Laura might be one of those three people in that case, because you, you, you clearly are, um, you, you like alternate between you have novels and story collections and you're clearly like passionate about and um, about both these forms. And I know you to be like a real evangelist for, the, for especially the story form. Um, and in an interview with Entertainment Weekly, you said that when you first read a story um, by Amy Hempel, you had I had anticipated lethal boredom and ended up feeling as though I had received a divination. I couldn't yeah. remember ever having read a short story before and knew so little about the form that I ran around calling them tiny novels until I was gently corrected. <laughs> 
Um, and I wonder if you could talk about what, what did this collection as a book, what did it look like when you first saw or recognized it as a book and how has that changed um, over the years? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I no shade on the novel. I mean, I love obviously, you know, work as someone who works in long form. I mean, there's so many things that I love about the form of the novel and so many stories that I, I still want to tell that just can't be contained by the short form. So I really love the capaciousness and I'm drawn in some ways to the capaciousness of the novel. But short stories are also like Short stories are my heart, you know, sure, I wouldn't be a writer. I, unfortunately, like maybe wouldn't even be a reader um, if I hadn't have found short fiction when I did. I mean, short stories, like the, the most important thing that Amy Humple's story did for me is it turned me into a reader. And then once I had been turned into a reader, it became possible for me to be turned into a writer. But like the second thing couldn't have happened if the first thing didn't happen. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, short stories are just like foundational, not only to who I am as a person, but to my um, artistic practice and to my practice as a reader. Um, and so it's a form that I will always go back to. And with Wolf, you know, I, I knew that I, my next book was going to be a story collection. Um, and I had a lot of stories. I think at a certain point when I just sort of printed out um, and compiled like all of the stories that could theoretically go in a collection together. Um, I think I had nearly 400 pages. And I was like, like no, nobody, <laughs> nobody wants a 400 page collection. Um, but I think, but for me, like one of the things that I really love and I'm very sort of interested in about the short story collection as a forum is that it's not just like a gathering of stories that were written over an arc of time, but it really is a chance to build a world and can almost be novelistic in that sense, where even if the stories aren't um, interconnected in a way that they would be with a novel and stories, you can build a world with its own sort of logic, its own atmosphere, its own weather system. And so it took me a while, I mean, probably kind of at least a year, maybe more of looking at this like stack of pages and sort of finding the book in there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and can you say more about the ghosts and the hauntings? Because um, I was thinking as you yeah. said that, I was thinking about how like, I feel as though ghosts and hauntings um, like are, are so, are, 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 are like all over your fiction from the start. Um, and I wonder if like, especially with a book that is, um, that isn't your first or second book, um, how what how did you how did you work with with these hauntings in a way that felt um because it does feel it feels like new it feels like it feels like it feels like it's your writing but it's like a it's like a it's like it's like it's like different Laura writing you know um sorry that was very fluent <laughs> it's, yeah could you just talk about the ghosts and like how do you put them in this book yeah, versus in other cool. books <laughs> um, yeah I mean I think that that I mean the the supernatural through line thinking about like looking at all these stories and trying to kind of pull a book out of it um so earlier at the top of the evening which I think tragically maybe not everyone could hear um, the poet um, Jadish Bande, who we were at a residence together two years ago, um, this amazing place called Shvitella, and he gave a, a beautiful reading um, of some poems. And yeah, so at this residency, um, I was working on stories and wrote like three or four stories in a row that did end up going in Wolf, um, where the hauntedness was really foregrounded. And I think somehow that allowed me to see that like oh this is the this is the weather system that will will kind of shape the world of the book ultimately um but i think i mean there's so many things i could say about my artistic and just like human interest in the supernatural but i think for me one of the most important questions to ask for a work of fiction is what is going on in a story or novel that cannot be bound by language. Um, and I know that that sounds kind of counterintuitive because as writers, like our medium is language, you know, we don't really have very much else to work with. Um, but what I mean by that is like, what is happening in this world that can't be bound by like direct sort of um, explicit expression, like, like what has to be kind of animated or come at sideways. And I think like the supernatural, 
Um, I think every work of fiction needs multiple modes of communication. Um, and I think that, you know, coming back to that question of like, what is this sort of supernatural uniquely equipped to communicate? Um, and I think like the, the ignored, um, the, the suppressed, the buried, no pun, no pun intended, um, the overlooked, et cetera. I mean, I think all of that matter um, the supernatural is like has is like kind of a beautiful, powerful, unsettling technology for looking at and and excavating what has been under the surface. Mm. I love that so much. Um, I want to ask you more about that, but I also want to switch back to um, to asking both of you questions. Um, and I wonder if we can talk about, especially given um, given what what else has been going on um, this year. I know you both to be um, enormously generous writers and readers, um, and I wonder if you could talk about how you think about literary citizenship um, and what aspects of it make sense to you, and maybe especially now when I know a lot of writers and artists are wrestling with um, amplified questions about how to be useful to fights for justice today, how to be useful to Black Lives Matter, like how to, how to, how to live as people in the world, as people who, um, who believe absolutely in the life-saving power of books, um, and but... Um, yeah, I'll stop there. <laughs> Either one of you. Do you want to go first? Yeah, go. I can. Um, I mean, I think, I think that there's, there's being a literary citizen and there's also being a citizen and, and, and that both are really important, but like one is not, this, I mean, obviously it goes without saying this is just my perspective, but like one is not a substitute for another. So I believe I absolutely believe that art can save lives and change minds and hearts. Um, I also believe that if my house were on fire, I would want someone to show up with like a fire hose and not a novel. Um, and so, I mean, I think that, that, that kind of acting, you know, as, as, a, as a citizen in whatever context we are able, um, you know, I mean, protesting, supporting organizations that are doing vital work, like having the, the challenging sort of ex expanding conversations with the people in our lives, voting, um, you know, being engaged in our communities. I mean, I, I feel like all of that just on a human level is so um, essential and and that, and that I, I, I don't, um, as much as I believe in the power of art to change hearts and minds. And I think art can work like in unison, you know, with all of that. Like, I don't mean to suggest that, that all of these kind of categories of engagement are compartmentalized. Like, of course, art can kind of be a part of that and be working alongside of that. Um, but I think that, that the, you know, it can be um, perhaps not so useful to lean too heavily on the like books will save us, art will save us. Um, and, and particularly, you know, when we find ourselves in a sort of deepening state of emergency and it's like, that is just the, the artistic engagement is just simply no substitute um, for, for being engaged in, in other more immediate ways as, as citizens. Um, and so, and also, I think, you know, I, you know, connected to that, I mean, I think so much about um, literary citizenship as, I mean, I think one, you know, again, it, it's something I, I could say so, so much about, but, um, but I think, like, it can be so helpful to, there's so much about the industry that um, is just so mystifying, you know what I mean? Like, I remember looking for, you know, when I was like, how do people get agents. Um, my husband's a writer and he had already managed to acquire one of these like mysterious agents. Um, and, and, you know, and, and I had other people who were farther along that I could ask, but I'm, you know, but, it, but like, what if you don't, you know, and I think even for me having people I could ask at that stage, like to go acquire an agent was like asking to like go acquire a unicorn or something like they seem so like, majestic and far away and like, why would, a, why would a unicorn want to talk to me? Um, and so, I mean, I think one thing that I feel really committed to is just, you know, it's someone who teaches or even just in casual conversations or conversations on social media is just transparency about my own path. Um, you know, it's just kind of one person's journey, but like there's no reason to have um, this kind of like mystical wall about like, how did you get an agent? How did you publish your first book? How did you publish your second book? Um, 
I think that that, um, though, ch you know, it, like obviously challenging in a lot of ways, I mean, I think the, the recent sort of publishing um, ha uh, paid me hashtag was, I, I mean, I do feel like that was a sort of really necessary generative conversation because there is so much kind of, you know, both active and, and I think also in some ways kind of un or just habitual silence about the kind of particulars of how our lives have worked as writers. And, and I think um, I've been really thinking a lot about how maybe I've been sort of usefully transparent um, in, in conversation with emerging writers and how I could be more transparent moving forward. Mm, yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, I mean, I agree with Laura completely. And I think the transparency, uh, the more transparent we can be as we move along in our careers. I also think mentoring writers and using our platforms to amplify other writers, especially emerging writers that might not be um, able to walk in through the front door of publishing is what I always say, you know, just really being thoughtful about your position in the publishing world. I also, you know, in my position as an editor at BuzzFeed News, I really take seriously um, whose voices I'm amplifying, giving people a platform and an opportunity to be published. I agree that there's so much, you know, people should be doing right now, um, but I also am very conscious of the position I'm in and what I can do in my position, publishing the work that I do. And I think, you know, I definitely agree that like, art has its place, but I think there's so much to be said for making people feel less alone and making people feel seen and heard. Um, and and basically recognizing that their life experience matters. If that's not what we see in publishing, you know, those aren't the people who are getting the million dollar book deals or the $2 million book deals, but those stories matter and giving them an opportunity to be published and and I have been very lucky as an editor across my career to publish a lot of emerging writers and start writers on their career. And I really have so much gratitude for that. But I think in general, you know, we're a community and treating each other as part of a community. And if someone is hurting or needs help or, you know, we are in the position to do so and, and we should. And that goes for like the larger community of this country and people who need need help. And I think this sort of American individual uh, American individualism has really screwed us over in many ways, as we're seeing right now. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm heartened to see people come together, both in the literary community and the larger community, to try to like do what the powers that be cannot do. Yeah, I love that. I've been thinking a lot about how, in some ways, despite the physical separation, I feel um, more connected with my friends and my communities than I think I ever have. And there's something about, um, and it's not a silver lining. I don't believe in silver linings, um, but but it is it is a consolation, and it's and it's it's a source of warmth. I think. Um, and yeah, Laura, what, what you were saying about how there are there are there are, there's assumed it's it's assumed that like people know how to get agents, how to even like write a query note to an agent. Um, and I think the more that we take that as a given, the more um, the more knowledge is not um, equally distributed. The more like the more inequity there's just going to be. Um, and it's definitely it's definitely um, classist. It's definitely racist. It's it's elitist that um, that that the knowledge is not like as available as it should be. Um, well, I um, I'm going to ask. I know we're. I'm going to ask you all one more question, um, and then I will switch to comments. And I know we have our com not comments to two questions. Um, we have these in the we have these down low. Um, and if anyone else wants to add any, we still have time to add your questions. And I'll try to get in as many as we can. Um, so my last question is: Can you talk about your titles, um, which are both so perfect, I think, um, and like very different? <laughs> um, yeah, I, it's interesting. My I had the title of Untitled Grief Project on the book for like six <laughs> years. <laughs> um, and I was like, what am I going to call this that does not feel like corny? Uh, you know, how am I going to contextualize this? And I was filling out health insurance paperwork and it was asking me like, what life event have you had? 
you know, to change your insurance. And I was like, God, that's so perfect. It's like encapsulates the entire experience of this book. So it really was a totally random thing that just fell out of the sky and made perfect sense. Mm. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I love, I mean, I love the title of your book, Carolina, and I think it suits the novel so beautifully. Um, and also I have my, right now my desktop is like littered with documents that are various untitled this, untitled that. So that like gives me hope that one day one of them maybe could grow in, into something real. Um, so I came across that Latin, the, the translation from the Latin, a, a Latin phrase, um, I hold uh, a wolf by the ears um, when I was looking something up for the title story and it became the, the title of that story. Um, and then originally the story collection was titled Aftermath. Um, and then the story, the story titled Aftermath um, got pulled out in the later stages. And, and then I didn't have a title. And so I was sort of looking around at the, you know, the other stories and I was thinking I could call it Slumberland. I could call it this. I could call it that. Um, and they all in some ways like seem too specific to the world of the story to be the title for the book. Um, but I think I hold it all by the ears and the idea of these characters kind of being in these really thorny situations for which there is no clear path out. Um, I mean, I think that that certainly spoke to um, the the broader concerns of, of the book. And I think also like the title story to my mind has the most of like all of the stories in it. Um, like it is not necessarily fantastic in the way that some of the other stories are, but there is that sense of surreality. Um, it has a lot of the sort of thematic concerns. And so in some ways, it's uh, just as a title story, it seemed like the, the like ideal ambassador for the collection. Um, and that, that, yeah, like the decision to title. I also, I love long titles. My first collection of stories had a very long title. And then I like progressed to shorter and shorter and now yeah and now I'm back to, I'm back to long but I love I love the music of the long title mm, yeah because your last title was third hotel and I remember thinking Laura's going really short for long <laughs> I know, I know. and the title before it was find me I was down to like a whole <laughs> two words <laughs> uh, well I think I think they're both um Perfect titles for incredible books. Um, okay, we'll switch to audience questions. Um, and I know the first one was: Is there a visual artist? It's from Bomb, um, which, as you may, as you probably know, is 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 wonderfully inter interdisciplinary in its um in, in in terms of like the arts it covers. Okay, so is there a visual artist you can think of who influences your work, or musician, or film? Artists that, and so at this residency that Jay and I were at together, we were also there with this amazing um, visual artist named Saya Wolfock, and she, um, her work is is multi. She uses different kinds of media in her work, but I think of her as being primarily um, an installation artist. And I love Saya's work for the way that. Um, you know, she's in conversation with story and in conversation with narrative and that her her projects um, over like multiple exhibitions will often um, span like different storylines and different temporalities. So, I mean, there really is like a kind of novelistic scope to what she does. And she's also talked in interviews about um, kind of through her work sort of playfully um, using art to reimagine kind of hierarchy and to reimagine like the systems that shape our world. And I always think, you know, in any sort of arts practice, that's such a um, that's such a beautiful kind of idea, right? That the idea that we can use story to reimagine the world. Um, and if we and to reimagine sort of different ways to be in the world. Mm. I love that. Um, so as I was saying, a few friends of mine and I were, they're visual artists. We traveled around the West together for the last, God, three years um, on different trips. And as I was working on my book and doing research, my friend Rosalind Crow, who's a fine art painter, was working on um, these incredible sort of acid West 
uh, paintings of the West. And it was really exciting because she was taking photographs of succulents and different crazy rock formations while I was like, had a notebook or sending notes to myself on my cell phone. And I think her work specifically really speaks to mine because it's tackling the mythology of the West and sort of like this idea that you can reinvent yourself completely here. Um, it's a place to disappear. We were actually working on a film together around like uh, a televangelist who had squirreled herself away in West Texas. And so I feel like the last four or five years were completely consumed with Western landscape. And she had several art shows with these incredible, huge scale um, paintings. And it really feels like those trips were generative to both of us and our work was very much in conversation with each other. Um, and then, you know, there's people like Stephen Shore who took a lot of photos of the West and was also trying to capture a certain time in the West and the possibility of the West. And I think my novel is very much like looking at, at people's dreams of the West, whether or not they worked out and sort of the remnants of this great American idealism and, you know, feeling like anything was possible and we're not really there anymore in the history of our country. Um, but that doesn't keep people from trying. And that was definitely something I was super interested in and that sort of atmosphere of being able to walk into the desert and get lost. No one knows who you are and you can be anybody. Mm. Hi. Hi. <laughs> and then and then there were two. <laughs> <laughs> should we start uh, just asking each other questions or should I go in to ask a question and see? I think so. If we, yeah, what happens if we Oh, okay. I can ask myself this question. Um, what research, what was the research like for this book? How did you enter the world of exit guides and death doulas? Um, that's a great question. Thank you, Naila. Um, so I did, I've said this in an interview, but the way I even learned about the world of exit guides is from a criminal podcast. Uh, it was an episode about a woman who worked as an exit guide. She had been arrested for assisting suicides. And I was fascinated because I didn't realize there were these kind of helpers. I had only ever heard of this through Jack Kevorkian and very tabloidy headlines. Um, but she really talked about the empathy behind this action and this collective of people who are very interested in being with people at the end of their life and helping them out of their suffering. And so I started doing research in that world, reading books on it. There's a few books. Um, hi. Um, I started doing you know, research there. And then I actually took some courses, death doula courses that I found to really be around people who were making the choice to help other people die. And I just want to be clear that there's a difference between assisting suicides and death doulas. And traditionally death doulas are helping people as they reach their own end. Um, and sit with them and help them prepare for their death, for their the end of life. Um, and it's also helping families go through the end of life process. So I was in those two worlds and they both fascinated me and I immersed myself in a lot of like the world of death preparation. And um, yeah, I started writing this book and pulling elements from both and you know, came up with this. Thank you, Carolina. Um, maybe Laura will have one last question for you. And then I know um, I know Libby wanted to come back on. Um, this is a shame. I, I have so many more questions for you. And there are so many audience questions for you all. Uh, Laura, did you experiment with any new techniques or styles while you were writing the stories in Wolf? Yeah, I did. Um, I wanted, so in my previous collection, The Isle of Youth, it was seven seven stories and they were all like 
pretty long. Um, and and I, I, I really wanted to figure out how to write sort of a more distilled story, a story that could um, do what those longer stories did in, in less space. Um, and, and just kind of thinking about like, you know, where I'm starting from and how I'm moving through time and all of those questions. I also like, I love, I really resist the idea that the short story, because it's a small space, deals with kind of small things. Um, my favorite stories are ones that are really expansive in terms of both like time and experience. So that question of, I think I knew how to be expansive in that way if I had like 30 pages, um, but it's like, can you get a life in 10 pages? Um, and that was that sort of, you know, compression while also like not sacrificing breadth or depth um, was a challenge that I kind of set for myself um, with some of these, some of these stories. Um, and then there are also other more kind of playful experiments in form, um, you know, writing stories in fragments uh, and, and things like that. Like your, there's a story um, about a woman who impersonates uh, dead wives for uh, bereaved husbands called Your Second Wife. And that's a story that's written in fragments and short sections. And it was like really, it did feel like very fun and playful sort of in terms of the structure, even though the story deals with like some heavy things um, to write all these fragments and then figure out like the shape that they should go in. Mm -hmm. um. Well, I have, um, I have uh, Libby, um, Libby is saying that we don't have to have a heart stop at five. And so in theory, if y'all are up for it, um, she says we could fit in a few more questions, but I thought I'd check, does that work for you all? Does that sound okay, Laura and Carolina? Yeah, yeah. okay. I and um, <laughs> and uh, for anyone else, just in case anyone does leave to leave at does need to leave at five, um, I just wanna say, uh, once again, encourage you very, very warmly encourage you to pick up the book from that loyalty bookstore link right below Carolina Delora's faces. Um, okay, let's go on to one more uh, or a couple more questions I think we could fit in. Um, I would love to hear, Lisa says, I would love to hear what all three of these amazing writers have been reading lately. Yes, always a fun, always a fun question. Um, I'm very lucky I'm reading the new Elena Ferrante, which I think got pushed to September. I got a galley mm. and I dropped everything that I was doing uh, to read it. I I have like three books open on my bed. And one is um, also Diane Cook's The New Wilderness that is coming soon in August. She just got long listed for the booker and I believe she is in the audience. Uh, and then the best book I actually just finished uh, was Colson Whitehead, uh, The Nickel Boys, which was like a pure work of genius. And when I'm writing fiction, I'm usually not reading fiction widely. So I'm always super late on everything when I'm writing. So I'm happy to be catching up. But those are the three shout outs I wanted to give. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, I'm reading, I've been doing a lot of rereading this summer and now I'm as as the as the remote fall semester looms, I'm um, rereading for teaching. Um so I'm just for like my own pleasure, um I'm rereading um Sebald's The Rings of Saturn. Um oh, yeah, which has been which I've been reading in a really long time and it's been like so interesting to um, meet that that book again, and um, I'm teaching a class on on writing the now in the fall. Um, so writing from a space of closeness as opposed to one of of, of greater distance. Um, and I've been rereading um, Ross Gay's The Book of Delights, which is such like an amazing book of essays, um, and and written as sort of like one entry a day kind of. Um, like a daily essay, and um, and it's a it's a gorgeous book. Um, and then for a different uh, class, um, I've reread like twice this summer because the stories are just so good. Um, Octavia um, Butler's uh, Blood Child mm -hmm. um, and the title story. Yeah, if you love science fiction and you love short stories, like there you go. Mm -hmm. can't, can't do better. The ti yeah title story especially is really incredible. Yay. Um, 
I uh, let's see. I'll add. So for the first three months, that um, I couldn't. I could barely read fiction. I couldn't finish a single novel. I couldn't even really talk about it while it was happening because it was so um, disorienting. And I was just like, "What if I can never read a novel again? What if that means I can't be a novelist? I'm not reading. I can't write." Um, and it was. But that whole time, I was able to read poetry. Um, and I was so grateful for that because that was that was something that like kept helping me believe that uh, words were going to come back to me and I could come back to words. Um, and then in the middle of this one, Ghost of um, by Diana by Diana Coywin, um, it's incredible. It's so beautiful. It has these like it has a lot of these like cutouts, yeah. um, and there are like and they're like from like family pictures, and it has a lot to do with the death of a loved one. Um, it's incredible. Like the whole book is giving me chills. Um, really, also excited about. Brian Washington's um, new novel. I'm still like show and tell, sorry. I keep like all my books <laughs> right next to me lately. Um, but this is Brian Washington's um, Memorial, which was just excerpted in the New Yorker this week. Um, and I just started it and I know it'll be wonderful. I loved his story collection. Um, you know, another one, I shut this one out a lot, but I swear it was the only thing I could read other than like sad, terrifying articles for the first month of the pandemic was um, was Postcolonial Love Poem by Natalie Diaz. Um, it's it's just it's it's incredible. Every poem is 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 like this perfect complicated world. Um, I'm I'm like keep even though I finished one re read of it, I'm keeping it like right by my desk because I know I want to reread it really soon. Like I just want to like go through the whole thing again, and then I probably want to spin through it for the rest of my life. Um, but so uh, that's that. Uh, let's ask one more question, and I feel as though it's a thematically appropriate one. Um, so Joanne asked, I don't. Joanne said, I don't think I'm alone in reading the pandemic and everything. Are there any strange prescient moments in your books that speak to current events? Um, and I thought with all the ghosts, demons, spookiness, that this could be a good a good last question. Um, yeah, what was weird actually at the beginning of the pandemic, and just to jump off of what Reese just said, I could not read for the, like, I think Colson's book was the first read, book I finished during the pandemic, I was totally unable to read. But what was really interesting to me at the beginning of the pandemic, when people were like the, the idea that death could happen to anyone felt so acute and people were starting to really think about their like end of life wishes and filling out their health directives, which is a big part of the beginning of my book and not something that I was thinking about until I was taking these death doula courses and to see this like mass movement of people start thinking about like, what, do I want to be on a ventilator? Do I like, how do I want to die? Uh, if I get really ill was really something um, that surprised me and felt like, wow, I was, I've been thinking about this for the last four years. <laughs> And mm -hmm. suddenly it felt like a mass conversation around this. And I think in general in America, people are really uncomfortable talking about death. They're really, mm -hmm. there's no like big death planning movement. Um, I think just the idea of like hospice care has only started coming more into the fore. And so I think just the idea of this like mass grief and mass planning uh, definitely feels like something that was in my book and is now everywhere. Yeah. 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 And I think, I mean, I think that that's something that's so amazing about your book, Carolina, um, too, is that it just, it's like we need better language to deal with death and grief than what, or at least in, in my experience, what feels sort of available. Um, because it's 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 often the, the kind of mainstream language around death and grief and dying feels so sort of superficial and insufficient to deal with like the profundity um, of the of the actual experience. Um, but and but yeah, I mean, I I see that like so much. Your book being so engaged in kind of that project, and um, that certainly feels pressing now. Um, I. Uh, I think in these stories, I mean, I feel like a lot of these stories turn on moments where the supernatural sort of introduces itself into the character's life in such a way that she can kind of never see her own life in the same way again. Um, 
and I, I do feel like the, the sort of the pandemic has has had that effect for a lot of people where it's sort of been like, you know, an x-ray um, and wherever there was, you know, in, instability um, in one's life, the, the, the pandemic, you know, has kind of heightened it, intensified it, m turned it from sort of like a low buzz to something that's really um, unavoidable. Um, and I think for any of us that were still harboring illusions of the idea that we live in a country that's in any way sort of just or equitable um, in, in kind of both like macro and, and micro ways. It's, you know, I think the pandemic has really demolished um, whatever uh, illusions were perhaps still being harbored. And um, yeah, I mean, I can see, I, I can see resonance there, I guess, um, the idea that um, you know, something happens and, and, and your perception of the world is just fundamentally different after. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, that's, um, thank you so much for that. And thank you for your questions, everyone who has questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions. Um, but Laura and Carolina both have um, more events coming up um, and they look really exciting and fun. So that's another place where you could, where you could catch them if you wanted. Um, and I believe, is there, I think, Libby's coming back on. Um, is there anything else you all want to say, Laura, Carolina? Anything that we didn't get to get to? Just Thank saying. You all so much. We yeah. made it. We, we made, made it. it. We did Thank it. You so much. Thank for, you so much. Twenty yeah, five did not bring us down. Hanging in there with <laughs> us. Yeah, right. The demons tried to beat us down, but we yeah. were like, not not today, Satan. <laughs> 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 like we are gonna we are gonna stay on this crowd cast yeah. until we figure some shit out. <laughs> yeah, we will be heard. <laughs> <laughs> and um, thanks for all everyone sticking with us and yeah, like it's thank you so much. Joy. Yeah. And Reese, thank, thank you for your great questions. Thank you for your questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah, of course. Um it looks as though I believe Libby might be locked out. <laughs> okay, Libby is asking us to say good night um, okay. for, for her and okay. her bomb. Um, so good night, everyone. Thank you good so night, much. Everyone. Thank Hope you. to see you soon at another at another of these events yeah. or another Laura's or Carolina's events. And yeah. uh, thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks.